Well, thank you guys so much for being here, all of our online fam. So glad to have you with us. Can we make some noise for our online family? So excited for today. Uh, last week, if you were hanging out, we started a brand new series called Rabbi, and uh, it's all these teachings and stories, these parables uh, of Jesus that he gives to people. Um, and uh, last week, Josh started this off, and he talked about the parable of the sower uh, and the different soils, the different dirt that the seeds fell upon and how we represent the dirt and, and, and what we seek to understand, the importance of seeking to understand, to truly listen to what God is saying to us as he teaches us and grows us. Uh, and ultimately, uh, what we're getting into when we talk to these parables is, and what I think Jesus is doing, he's saying, hey, this is how, you know, he starts them off often, and we'll see it in our parable today, but this is how the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of God is like, and then he'll tell this story, right? So basically what he's jumping into is going, hey, this is the way, right? Any Mandalorian fans out? there. Come on. I'm like three episodes behind, and so I'm binging it tonight. You're like, yo, you missed, chill. You missed out on a bunch, huh? No, but that's, uh, it, it's, it's that exactly. This is the way. Now go and walk in it. Some of you guys are like, actually, Prophet Isaiah said that first, and then Mandalorian stole it. Anyways, my Bible nerds. Uh, but that's exactly what this is. This is it. This is God's way. This is his kingdom. This is how he works. Learn this. Understand it. Follow this. Pursue it. Make it important in your life. The reality is, is that so many times we hear God teach us, we read the word of God in scripture, and we look at these parables that Jesus teaches, and he's like, this is the way, and we're like, what's the way? You know, at the end, it's like, I heard you, but it's just, it's hard to click, and again, the importance of seeking. And if that's you, it's, don't get frustrated, don't feel alone. Even the disciples, constantly, after Jesus would give a parable, they'd be like, you know, the whole time he's preaching and teaching, they're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And afterwards, you're like, mm -mm, Lord, I, I need some help. You know what I mean? I didn't get a single thing. And so we're going to learn together today uh, and dig into another one. Uh, so just to, to get straight to it, I'm actually going to read the parable that we're walking through together. And it's a, it's a good chunk of scripture. This parable is called the parable of the vineyard workers uh, or the parable of the workers in the vineyard, tomato, tomato, Dorito, Dorado. Those don't make sense. Uh, but we're going to read through this um, and then we're going to talk some more about it. So we're going to start Matthew 20 verses 1 through 7. So here's what it says, for the kingdom of heaven, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So come to an agreement with these workers early in the morning. Here's what you're going to be doing. Here's how much we're going to, here's the wage for today. Everybody's happy with it. Let's get to work. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give to you. So they went, right? Going out, hiring more people. These other guys are already working. Let's get some more help. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. One more time, two more times, going out to hire more people. And about the 11th hour, 11 hours into the workday, he went out and found others standing still. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. So just real quick, take a break before we continue reading. Uh, just some interesting things here. So you've got these workers uh, who this landowner is like, hey, my, my vineyard needs some work done. I need some hands to get it done. And so he hires people. And let's just be real. This man does not just hire a few. He's got some jangle in his pocket and he's hiring people left and right. Like, you get a job, you get a job, you get it, right? And he's like, come on out. And so let me give you just a timeline of what this looks like. And so uh, people have studied this passage over and over. They're like, here's what we're thinking. Like in reality, the time frame was, is that these first workers that he first met early in the morning when it says that, they probably got started around 6 a.m. That's an early morning, guys, okay? That is, I mean, I don't even know if the spirit is moving around then, but it's early. No, just kidding. But it's early, early, early. And so he gets out, they get out there, they start working, and he's like, okay, there's plenty of work to be done. He goes back to the marketplace. There's people still standing there. He's like, let's get after it. Come work for me as well. And then again, it says uh, at, at the sixth hour and even the ninth hour, we don't have that up there, but around 3 p.m., more people hired, come work for me. And then the last the 11th hour, 11 hours into that workday, around 5 p.m., the sun's starting to come down, you know what I mean? These people are finishing up their work, and he's going out there, and he's hiring more people. He said, come work for me. There's work for you, too. And there's this interesting thing that happens here, is the landowner asks them when he sees them in the marketplace, hey, why are you guys just standing around like all idle? Why are you, why are you just standing here? You know, and I think the assumption, it's easy to make the assumption these guys were like the lazy guys. Maybe they got up at like 4 p.m. or like now it's time to go to work, right? It's like, no, no, no. It says that these people would come and they would stand there. It says no one has hired us, right? 
We have stood here all day because no one has hired us. So the reality is at this time is these laborers, these workers would go out and they would wait in the marketplace all day long, right? All day long to be hired for work. They were, they were you know, bottom of the, of the totem pole. They were down here in regards to the hierarchy of society and stuff like that. They needed to make some money because if they didn't make some money, their families were going to go hungry that day. And so it was important for them. They would show up. These guys who got hired at the 11th hour, I can almost guarantee they were there at 6 a.m. with the other guys, but nobody would hire them. But they knew, I cannot leave here until I get some wage. I need something to provide for my family. And so I will wait all day long until somebody hires me. So again, not just hanging out, being lazy, but waiting for work. And they get that. Even as the lower class citizens, they get that work so they can make the wage for their family. So we'll continue on in, <clears throat> in verse 8. It says, and when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired uh, about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. So just real quick, they've got all these workers, the day's done, those 11th hour workers are probably there for the last hour, you know, kind of cleaning up, probably putting the guy's tools away, like, hey, let me help out, you know. These other guys are just drenched in sweat, working in the, the summer heat, just, you know, getting after it, they're exhausted, and they're like, okay, time's up, time for you guys to come in, and we're going to pay you. And so the landowner's like, hey, here's what I want you guys, I want to I pay these people. Uh, I want them to line up with whoever showed up last first, and whoever showed up first last, at the end of the line, basically. And I'm going to give them their pay. It's so like, okay, a little weird, but you give them their pay. And so we'll continue on in verse 10. Now, when those who, had, those who were hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. This weird moment, right? I don't know if you see this, but if I'm hired first, and I've been there since 6 a.m., first off, I would like to get some jangle in my hand before you know, anybody else who just showed, here, showed up here an hour ago, but that doesn't work, so it's okay. Maybe there's something else going on here, right? Maybe the reason I'm at the back of the line is he's going to give the first guy a Daenerys, which again, if you remember, that's what we agreed to. That was for the 6 a.m. workers. That was the contract, if you will, of you'll work for this wage, and that was a fair wage for the day. That's a Roman silver coin of like, hey, here's your wage for the day. That's I did it. I got some money in my pocket. This is, I'm in a good spot. That's what they agreed to. And so if you're the 6 a.m. worker, you're like, oh, wait, maybe he changed his mind. He's given these people who have only worked for an hour that, and we, the all-day workers, laborers, we get some more. So verse 11, when they receive, or verse 10, again, now that when those hired first, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. So obviously it doesn't go how they expected. They receive the exact same amount and they're frustrated, right? They see these guys who have barely been there, who have just worked in the evening breeze, you know, just enjoying their time for one hour. They're getting the same pay as the guys who have been there since 6 a.m. And they come out and they're like, sir, this is not fair, Right? This is not okay. We've been out here busting our butt in the heat, and you're going to give them the same pay as us? Like, you're not, you're not bumping ours up. You're not giving them less equal pay across the board for every single one of us. The reward is the same. This is not fair. And you might be sitting here, and you're like, they're right. <laughs> Those guys are totally right. That's not cool. That's not fair at all. Like picture it in your own life. Imagine you're working your hourly job and you, and, and you come in and you've been there since open and then your boss calls in some help for somebody for the last hour of, of your shift and they help you out and you're both close together and your boss is like, oh wait, before you leave, let me pay you and he gives you both the same amount on a paycheck and you're like, give me your paycheck, bro. <laughs> right? Because that's just, how does that make sense? That's not fair. It makes me think of my kids. So uh, oftentimes, like, so our kids have a little playroom that they get to have all their toys in and stuff, and, and, and I'll just tell you the truth, that thing becomes a disaster very quick. Uh, and so there's times like, oh, can we, like, in the summer, they're like, can we have a popsicle, Dad? I'm like, yeah, you can have a popsicle, and we'll go outside and eat them. But first, you got to clean up the playroom. And it's like, dun, dun, dun. You know, they're like, ah, it's the worst ever. And it's like, come on, we got to clean up the playroom. And then they, you know, they're like, okay, okay. And so they, after years, they clean it up, and, <laughs> and they get after it, and it's done eventually. And then they'll come in and they're like, oh, but in the midst of all of you, you always hear like, oh, they're not helping. So-and-so's not cleaning. And then they come like, we finished it. Can we have our popsicles? And then one of them, sometimes Liam will go, well, Ellie barely cleaned up. 
or Ellie would go, Liam didn't pick up anything. All he did was play with his race cars, right? And what they're implying is they didn't do anything. I deserve a popsicle, not them. They don't deserve the reward. I do because I put in the work. I made sure it happened. If they get one, that's not fair. Now, if I'm being honest, this is not just something that relates to children. This is us. How many times have we, as, as, as grown people, maybe not verbally and audibly, but in our heads even said, that's not fair, when we witness a situation that we disagree with, right? Where maybe somebody receives some kind of favor or blessing and we're like, man, I don't really like that they got that. Because I've been getting after it. I've been making sure my stuff was done, and yet this person just kind of slides in and people are like, great job. We get frustrated with what we think people haven't earned. They don't deserve that. They haven't earned that. We do this. And oftentimes we do this, and, and, and the big core of, of, of this frustration with fairness, because that's what this is, this isn't fair, it all has to do with me. It's very me-centric. This doesn't look fair to me. This doesn't seem fair to me. What about me? What about the work that I have done? Look at how hard I worked. Look at me. All right? And it's good. You've worked hard. Working hard's a good thing. We have a tendency to get very upset in so many areas of our lives about what is fair and what is not, what we think we've earned, what we think others earned, and what they deserve and what we deserve, and the craziness, the chaos of that. And the truth is, is it's a dangerous place to be. Because sometimes this idea of fairness bleeds over into our walk with Jesus. And what we do is we look at the blessing and the favor that God pours out, the grace that God gives. And we're going to talk a lot about grace today, just to let y'all know. And we're going to talk a lot about grace and the grace that God gives to others. And how sometimes we look at it and go, wait, they got grace? Them? The one who hasn't earned it, the one who's done nothing like I've done, that's not fair. I would never. Come on. That's not fair, God. Is fairness the focus? That's the question for us today that we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive into. Is fairness the focus? Is it the thing? Is, 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 is our idea, our concept of what is fair from our minds, is that what we should really be leaning on? Is that what we should be focusing on? Is it the right place? Maybe not. Because maybe when we do that, we're missing out on something else that God is doing in the midst of this favor he's pouring on other people. Maybe we're missing out on this big picture plan that God has for all his people and the big picture nature and love and heart of God that is for all people. Is fairness the focus? So to answer this question, we're going to continue on in our parable. Uh, and we're going to continue on in Matthew 20. We're going to go to verse 13 and finish this parable from Jesus. And so, again, you've got the workers, the vineyard workers. They're frustrated. It's not fair. They're getting paid the same. The guys who have just gotten paid and they've been there for an hour are like, this is sick. You know what I mean? And they're getting out of there. And so here's how the landowner responds, verse 13. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me? for a denarius. Did we not come up with a plan, a contract from the beginning of what this was going to be? Nothing's changed. Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. I choose as the owner. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. That's one of those lines, again, that Peter and the disciples are like, what? <laughs> What's he saying? So again, Jesus, if you look back at the beginning of the parable, the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what I want to talk about today. I want to give two points on what this parable and, and, and this landowner's response to the frustrated workers, what it reveals to us about the kingdom of heaven, really about God himself, about his way, his heart for his people, and who Jesus is. The kingdom of heaven, number one, is under God's authority. 
The kingdom of heaven is under God's authority. Sounds on the nose, right? But think on it for a second. In this picture, in this parable, who are the workers? We are. A A plus. Let's go, class. We are the workers. And the landowner is God himself. God is in charge. We are not. If you've made the decision to make Jesus Lord of your life, you have said, I am no longer in charge. I no longer steer the boat. I am no longer the captain of this ship. You are. And you will decide where I go, how I go, when I go, what I do when I go. God is in charge. We are under his authority. Romans 9, 14 through 16 says, for God, excuse me, 15 through 16, for God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose, anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. When it comes to the mercy and the grace of God, it is completely under his authority, and we really don't have a say in that. And that's not because God is a hateful God or a God who wants to to control things in a way that hurts others. No, 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 but he knows what's best. He knows what we need. And so he is in charge. He knows how and when, like we said, and what and all that we need. And the reality, if we're being super honest, is when we read something like that, we get frustrated. Because again, that doesn't seem fair. Maybe you say that it's not about what I've done or what I think, but, but I have done, and I do think, right? We get frustrated. Here's why I think we do. I think we get frustrated because we do not understand the ways of God, right? We may know our God, and and, and don't don't hear me wrong on this. God reveals himself to us plainly in so many ways, in beautiful ways. He wants us to know his heart, who he is, his character, his nature. He wants us to be in relationship. He wants us to be close. He wants to be known and seen by us, amen? Amen. But there's plans and and, and, and the mind and the, and the, 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 the process and just God himself, his sovereignty, There's no chance we could even get close to understanding it all. But that frustrates us. So I've mentioned this before, but I have this like deep desire to be like, you know, the handiest man in the world, just on the side, you know, just for some fun. Uh, But it's a process, okay? I'm learning as I go. Um, And so one of the things I've learned how to do is to use a chainsaw barely. Um, and so like, it, I've, I think I mentioned this before as well, that when I first got the chainsaw, and actually I was using somebody else's, I definitely hit my knee and like sliced my knee open. It's still there. Um, so we're, we're good. But it's a learning process. I just want to be good though. Like I want to be that dad that when my kids are older, they're like, this is broke. And they're like, dad. You know what I mean? I'm like, I got it. You know, just a hammer in my back pocket at all times. And so anyways, when I first got this chainsaw, I was so excited. I'm like, oh, dude, I'm about to, you know, cut down trees and, like, do all this and, like, make my yard look nice and, you know, thought it was exciting. And then I got home and realized you had to know how to use a chainsaw. <laughs> dude, okay, these gas, the gas-powered equipment, there's 9,000 steps to start these things, okay? <laughs> like, the choke is the scariest thing in the world to me. You're like, it's like, all right, first thing you got to do, pull the cord 76 times and then pray over it and then close the choke and you're like what am I doing, you know? And it's like, let it sit for 15. It's like, (laughs) I don't understand. Pull it eight more times. It's just, it's insane. And the process was so confusing and hard that I just went to the almighty YouTube and was like, please, you know what I mean? It was like, show me how to do this. Watch the YouTube video, figured it out. Not really, because I used it for a little bit and it kept dying on me. And I was like, I don't know how to use this thing. And because I lacked understanding on the resource I was using, I was frustrated. Because we lack understanding on who God is, we get frustrated. I don't know your ways, God, and I'm mad about it. I just want to know the details and how this is supposed to work because here's what I think, God, and this makes sense in my mind. When you paint the big picture, I'm like, no, this is the right answer. And God's like, you don't know where my answers come from, dude. You don't, you don't even know how this works. We get frustrated. So quick, so easily. My frustration stems from my lack of understanding. Here's the truth. You were not created. I was not created. None of us were created to fully understand the ways of God. And that seems intimidating, but at the same time, that should be very encouraging. Because that God who is big and above all, he's on our side. He loves me more than than anything else in the world. He loves you more than anything else ever, right? He's for us. 
It's an encouragement. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We are not on the same level. And that's a good thing. Praise God. Because our level often ends up with slight sneeze, right? And problems and brokenness and, and frustration, and that's not fair. If we were in charge, it'd be a whole lot of complaining and frustration of what's fair and what's not. And a lot of achieving of nothing. A lot of reaching and saving of nothing. Praise God that he's in charge. So again, to close that point up, we, we are called to that. We are called to that surrender, to that submission and saying, Lord, your ways are better than mine. I surrender. Have your way. I'm yours. Again, take the wheel with it, all of it, right? And we often forget that like the vineyard workers, that that's the deal we make when we, when we agree to follow Jesus. When we agree to make him Lord, we say, your way, God. Have your way in my life. Here's the agreement. Here's not a contract, but here's a covenant that you give everything to me, God. You die for me on a cross. He gives everything. And what does he ask in return? Everything. That's the real truth, right? It's a free gift of God. And there's no kind of work we can do, like he said in the passage, right? In the parable, there's no kind of work we can do to achieve this, or in Romans, excuse me, that we can do to achieve the grace and the forgiveness and, and, and the relationship with Jesus. Nothing, just his kindness. And what he asks in return is just our lives. A surrender of who we are. Everything. My thoughts, my ideas, my plans, they are yours, God. And when we do that, we realize and we grow in the understanding and the trust that God is in charge and that is what's best. The kingdom of heaven is under God's authority. And that's a good thing. Second point, the kingdom of heaven is for the undeserving. The kingdom of heaven is for the undeserving. So it's important for us to, uh, to recognize and accept, again, the first, that it's under God's authority, because once we do that, we can do the same with this second point, that the kingdom of heaven is for the undeserving, the people who do not deserve it. So take a look at how Jesus finishes this parable again. Uh, verse 16 says, So the last will be first, and the first last. We read that, and again, it's like, I'm a little confused. What's going on here? So just to backtrack a little bit, uh, at the end of the chapter before this, chapter 19, uh, Jesus has this whole moment with the rich young ruler. You know that story of the rich young ruler? He shows up to, to, to Jesus, and he's like, hey, what do I have to do to spend eternal life with you, to get in right standing with you? And Jesus goes to him, and he's like, hey, you got to follow these commandments. And he lists out, and he's like, oh, I've done that. I do that all the time. And he's like, oh, by the way, give up everything. And the rich young ruler's like, maybe not. <laughs> And he's sad and he walks away. And at the end of that whole thing, and Jesus teaches and does all this, Peter, you know, being Peter, we can relate to Peter, right? He asks Jesus this question. He says, Lord, we've given up, Matthew 19, 27, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? And there's a weirdness there. You don't want to lean into it too much, but maybe there's a weirdness of, you know, you see Peter's humanity showing, you know what I'm saying? And he's like, hey, unlike that guy, I've said yes. You have it all. What's my reward? You know? It's like maybe there's some sincerity in there, but it's like, but it does feel a little bit different to ask that in that situation. What's our reward, Lord? Those of us who have given up every single thing and said, have your way. So this, this parable is believed to be uh, somewhat of a continuation of Jesus' answer to Peter's question. A continued answer of, of this heart issue that Jesus sees in us when it comes to the reward that we see for what we do for God. The choice to give up everything and say, I follow you, to make him Lord, to accept his authority, his charge as the landowner, and we're just the vineyard workers, right? Jesus sees an issue in our hearts here. And there's a lot of different ideas as to what this passage is truly digging into or truly pointing at. Some people and some uh, theologians think that this is a picture um, of different people coming into relationship with Jesus at different times in their lives. And so we've got the 6 a.m. workers who basically they've been in relationship with Jesus since the very beginning. They're the kids who grew up in church and were saved at 11 and, you know, they've been at it and they've got this relationship solid and they've spent their whole life devoted to the work of the Lord. Praise God for those people. That's a beautiful thing, right? And you've got other people who are showing up later on in life in their 20s, in their 50s, in their 60s, maybe in their 70s. And you've got these people maybe in their 70s at the 11th hour 
who are like, I got, you know, getting closer. It's like, I've lived this whole life doing everything I've wanted my way. And I've come to the realization that it's got to be God's way that I need Jesus. And they make the choice to come in. And so again, it paints this picture of these workers from 6 a.m. who've been doing it their whole lives. They're like, wait, that person who lived their whole life doing whatever they wanted, just sinning and having fun, they get the same grace and forgiveness that I get? And Lord, I I devoted my whole life to you? Can you feel the, the frustration with what's fair and what's not rising up. That doesn't seem right, Lord. Or maybe it's a picture of the Jews and the Gentiles, right? God's people, his Israel, who have been around, who who he has made the covenants and the promise with, and they are his people first, right? And then the Gentiles come in and the grace of Jesus, the forgiveness, the salvation through him, they find out it's for them too. (laughs) But Lord, we've been your people for years, centuries, this and they get it too. Yeah. Maybe it's all of it. Whatever the case, and what we do know, and what we see in this parable is one big word, grace. This is a beautiful picture of the amazing grace of God. His grace for us. And I'll say this, grace is the issue and the solution in this parable. Like the issue, how is it an issue? Right? It's not that grace in itself is an issue, but it's an issue to who? To us. To the laborers who cling to the concept of what is fair and what's not in our own minds and say, God, I've been a Christian way longer than them. So the favor and the grace should be pretty high for me, right? And maybe you're like, yeah, I'll let you slide into heaven to these people who are just coming in. Yeah, I'll let you experience eternal life just because. Maybe. Or maybe, for some of us, it's, hey, I may have messed up a little bit, but they've messed up a lot. And you're telling me that you're going to give them the same grace that you give me? That doesn't seem fair, God. Some of you guys are like, oh, no, we would, come on, we wouldn't say that. What about those people who have hurt you your whole life, been hateful to you your whole life? Did you know that they are loved and have been offered the same grace by Jesus Christ that you have? That's frustrating. That's hard, huh? Think big picture, man. Think of people like the Emperor Nero in Rome who was putting Christians on stakes, and if he wanted to make the choice and said, you know, I've realized I'm, I've been doing some rough stuff. Jesus, I make you Lord. Does he receive that same grace in Jesus' name? Yes, he does. If Adolf Hitler had a moment in the midst of all that he was doing and said, I've done some terrible things, and, and, and the light of Jesus shined in his heart and his life, and he said, Jesus, forgive me, does he receive the same grace? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Grace is for everyone. The amazing grace of God is for everyone. But they haven't earned it. Newsflash. Neither have you, and neither have I. Grace isn't fair, and that's a good thing. Because here's the reality. If grace was fair, we would be in a lot of trouble. We would be in a rough spot, church. Praise God that grace is not fair. Praise God. Instead of getting frustrated and saying, we all get the same We all get the the amazing big grace of God at the end of the day. Instead of getting mad about it, we should go, God, praise you that it is so unfair because, man, I need that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Everybody say all people. people. To all people to every single person, the grace of God is available. God's grace is for you, no matter what. Whether you've worked hard your entire life and done it all right, or you've pushed him away your entire life and got it all wrong, his grace is for you. His love is for you in the same way. That is the amazing grace of God. The kingdom of heaven is for the undeserving. We too are the undeserving. 
And that grace still remains. It's not about favorites. It's not about work completed or time done. It's available. Think of the, the thief on the cross. It's a beautiful picture of God's grace. And moments before his death, he's sitting there and going, I've realized it, Lord. You are the way. You are the king, Jesus. Forgive me. Today you will be with me in paradise. Not, hey, get this guy down. He's got to spend a couple years doing some ministry, and then we'll talk, right? Today you will be with me in paradise. Praise God. That should, man, that should shake us in the best way possible to the core. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace for me. And not just for me, but for them. And that's where it gets super messy. I'll tell you just real quick. So I went to, uh, went to the dentist last week. It was crazy. I haven't been to the dentist in a long time. Okay, I'll just be real with you. Do I have cavities? Who knows? Um, <clears throat> but I got a cleaning, okay? It wasn't the most comfortable thing in the world. I don't know why they use those, what are those called, scythes, basically, on your mouth. They just go crazy, dude. And just, yeah, anyways, I needed a cleaning. So they gave me a cleaning, and the, the dentist comes in. He's talking to me. He's like, oh, yeah. And again, maybe he said something about cavities. Maybe he didn't. You don't know. But he did say, uh, he's got all his dental work lined up for me, and he was saying, like, oh, we also just got to do a check. Like, in between your teeth, I just spit gross, in between your teeth, sometimes cavities like to hide in there, and you don't see them. On the outside, it looks pearly white, looks all good. But there's some, some brokenness, some decay, some rotting going on in between your teeth, potentially, right? So it's like, come back and we'll, we'll get some stuff figured out. It's like, awesome. I think this is a picture of the grace that we often have for one another. We've got God's amazing grace that is for everyone, no matter what, no matter when. And then we've got our rotten grace. That's what we're going to call it. Our rotten grace, this decayed grace that is circumstantial. And it says, hey, depending on what you've done, how long you've done it, who you are, that's the kind of grace I'm going to give to you. That's what you're going to receive from me. And it's this rotten grace. And it looks like, it looks like this. When we're caught up in rotten grace, we're staying in the spot of the vineyard workers. And we're staying in the spot of frustration that what we think is fair is right. That what we think people should get is the right thing, that we are the authority. But when we have grace like this, this rotten grace, what we're doing is we're giving out grace that is really not about them, it's all about me. How does the grace you receive make me feel? How does the grace you receive make me think? What does it do to me? We give out grace that thinks I've been wronged by God. That's rotten grace. God, I can't believe because you showed somebody else love you did me wrong. It's like, didn't we agree to this in the beginning? Didn't you say yes to this wage? Wasn't this the covenant promise? You give, I give you everything, you give me everything. So what are you upset about? I've, I've, I've not wronged you. We think we've been wronged because someone else has been blessed by God. We think we've been wrong because somebody else hasn't achieved what we've achieved as Christians in this life. That's rotten grace. I was talking to a friend yesterday, uh, actually mine and Rachel's neighbor, um, Matt and Katrina, and Matt made this point as I was telling him about this message, and he said, you know, sometimes we, we have this grace in our minds, like that decayed tooth, right? Like it's hidden grace where it looks good on the outside, but we're frustrated with the freedom that we see other people have before they follow Jesus. We're jealous and envious of the fact that they get to spend a majority of their life doing whatever they want, and then when they're ready, they get to make a choice to follow Jesus. Should we be jealous that there are people who are lost? Should we be jealous that they are not in relationship with Jesus? Or should our heart break for those people? And should our desire be to see them enter a relationship with Jesus? And to see it happen soon. Because we know that while on the outside, in the, in the perspective of the world, doing what you want seems fun and it seems exciting, we know that we've got the better end of the deal in Jesus. Right? Whoever makes the choice to make him Lord receives the better end of the deal. You receive the perfection of Jesus coming into your life, making you new, healing you, revealing true desire, who you were called to be, building you up, restoring you. 
And that only comes with Jesus. So why be envious, right? Another, pa- another translation of that, of that parable says that these, uh, these workers in the vineyard, they had the evil eye, envious and jealous that these other people only had to work for so long and still got the reward. That's rotten grace. The amazing grace of Jesus celebrates when anybody receives grace. We are called to always celebrate grace. When somebody comes to the Lord and they surrender and they say, your way over mine, no matter how much they have or haven't done, we celebrate. We say, praise God. Because now, new life comes. Now, eternal life comes. And it only comes through Jesus. Always celebrate grace. And when I do that, When I begin to work towards it and ask God to help me to say, hey, Lord, help me to celebrate grace always. What I begin to see is other changes, like the complaining, the comparison, it begins to go away, right? The frustration, it begins to go away. I get excited about life change, period, right? No matter who it is, who they are, what they've done, I get excited about it. I begin to learn more and more of who God is and his kindness and his heart for us. I learn to trust his way over my own always celebrate grace. Last thing, one of my favorite passages in scripture comes from the book of John chapter 3. It says this, John 3, 30 through 31. He must become greater and greater, being Jesus, and I must become less and less. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. This should be our heart's desire. This should be the prayer of our hearts is, God, let your ways, let what you've called me to become the biggest thing in my life. You, Jesus, are available to all. Let that desire for me and for those around me become the biggest thing. Become greater. Change my ways. Take away my selfishness. Take away what I think is right. God, be Lord. Be the authority in all that I am and all that I have. Become greater and make me less. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. God, we thank you that we get to be here in your house, that we get to worship you, we get to learn from you. God, that we get to connect with you in this relationship that we have. God, you are good to us. Lord, I pray that as we walk through just the the situations of grace, God, that you help us to recognize one, Lord, if we're giving out rotten grace, Lord, if there's a heart issue in the midst that needs to be checked, God, and cleaned and repaired and, and made new, Jesus, because maybe our grace isn't about the person, maybe we're not getting excited for them, God, but we see rather how it impacts us, and we're just missing it, Lord. Come in, Lord, and become greater. Make our hearts new, Jesus, and let the grace that you have, God, that amazing grace, let it pour out of us to those around us. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. We worship you. We praise you. It's in your perfect name we pray. And everybody said, amen.